Hey everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I want to give you all a chance to get on tonight. Ooh, my hair is everywhere. Uh, I'm excited to, um, share this word with you. Had a great time watching the football game tonight. Fly Eagles fly. Um, get everybody a chance to, uh, come on. Real excited about the word that God has for tonight. Um, I'm real excited about what God is doing. And so hope that if you're watching live or you're watching later, um, that you'll be able to come on and enjoy the word of God. Uh, it's a challenging word, but it's a good word because it gives us victory. So we just praise God tonight and thank God for um, all of you that will come on. I know a lot of you are probably watching the football game, the other football game. Um, but we pray that if you don't watch, if you're not with me live now, that you'll watch later because uh, God has a word for us. And uh, I'm so excited about that. So let's pray first and then we're going to get right into this word. Okay, Lord God, we thank you for another opportunity to share your word. We thank you that you have blessed us with life and life more abundantly. We pray that as we seek your face and as we pray and as we share this word today, that people will be strengthened and blessed and learn how to love you with their whole heart, whole soul, their whole mind, and their whole strength. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So for those of you that don't know, this is Life More Abundantly in Christ. And I am Winifred on Life More Abundantly in Christ. We believe and follow the commands of Jesus to go and make disciples and teach them. And this is what we do here. So over the past month, a lot of people have been in consecration, a time of fasting and prayer, seeking the Lord's face. And, at, and I was as well. At the beginning of this month, I shared a message about loving God with your whole existence and finding that command. If you go back on one of my other uh, reels, you'll be able to see the scriptures that go with that. And the video that I put out uh, right before earlier today, and I'm going to put it back up again, talks about uh, this life and uh, what it means to love God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole soul. And so I talked about that previously, so I won't go back into all of that. I recommend that you read the, um, watch the video from earlier today that explains all that. What I do want to touch on real quick before we get in, what we're talking about today is my idol, the idol called My Opinion. The idol called my opinion. And so it's important to understand the commands of God, which was reemphasized by Jesus, which is to love the Lord your God with your whole existence. And it's important to understand that so that when we talk about what it means to make an idol of ourselves and an idol of our opinion, you understand what that means. So when I was teaching, um, along, you know, the, all the years that I'm teaching, but I've taught uh, third grade and eighth grade. And one of the things that I had to teach was fact and opinion. And I love teaching fact and opinion because with teaching fact and opinion, there was uh, opportunity for the kids to uh, debate the things. They would come in in the morning talking about the latest artist or like tomorrow, you'll have a lot of people talking about the football game and who was the best team and who really had injuries and who's the who's the real MVP? A lot of that is people's opinions. And, you know, facts are things that you have evidence that you actually can prove. And opinions, a lot of times people think that opinions are based in people's feelings because sometimes it comes across that way. But it is how you think, actually. It's how you think. You use your mind to develop your opinion. Also, your opinion is developed through, your opinion is developed through your experience, mostly the culture, whatever the culture is that you live in. And so what we're going to look at today, and um, the scripture is the one that we had uh, that comes from um, Mark. We have one in Matthew, Mark, 
and Luke and all of those scriptures are the same where Jesus said the greatest command is the first and greatest command is to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind and your whole strength. Um, the scripture in Matthew doesn't use the word strength, I, I believe. Um, so we're going to focus on the mind. And the mind is where you develop your intelligence and your thoughts, where you reason. Um, when you look at the, the word in the Greek, it also uses uh, your feelings as well. But the first place that your opinion comes from is your mind. And so... I wanted to share with you uh, that, and you'll see those definitions there. And the thing about the mind is the things that are around us, the things that we look at, the things that we in listen to influence our thoughts. When people have an opinion about a, I'm just going to use an artist, the things that they watch, the things that are around them influence their opinion about that artist. It's not just their talent that influences their opinion. Uh, a lot of times people will have arguments and debates with people and the foundation of those arguments and debates aren't the same. And one thing that I was a communicate, well, I graduated as a communication major and I took a course in debate. And one of the things that I learned is the foundation of your argument has to be the same or you're not having a debate. So if you agree that, uh, the basis of you saying that someone is an MP, MVP, I'm just using this as an example. This is not how they do it, but that's not solely how they, but let's say we said the basis of somebody being an MVP in football is how many touchdowns they make. If we said that the basis of someone being a superstar is if they had, if they were an EGOT, that means they had an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. That would have to be agreed upon that that's the foundation of that argument. And then you go from there, providing evidence. Now, if you just say that, I'm just using this because a lot of people like her, that Beyonce is the best singer that ever lived. Okay, well, what is your foundation for that? Is your foundation the awards? Is your foundation the record sales? Because other than that, you're just giving an opinion. Same thing with acting. If I said, I'm just a, Robert De Niro is the greatest actor there ever was. Well, that's my opinion. If we don't have a foundation for that, is it his awards? Is it, is it the movies that the person has done? It's the same thing with, you know, how we look at, uh, things that occur in the news and, and people develop those opinions based on their, the, the culture that's around them, how they were raised, how they feel about the, and I'm saying feelings and their themselves. It's not just their feelings. It's how they interpret the world through their, through their culture. And culture can be the people in your family. The culture can be the community that you live in, but that has a major influence on how you think, not always how you feel, but how you think. And a lot of times because people are so passionate about their opinion. A lot of people think that opinions come from people's feelings, but it really comes from how you think. What does that have to do with idols? Well, first let's talk about the scripture in, in uh, Exodus and in Deuteronomy, um, when God is giving Moses the 10 commandments and when he reemphasizes the 10 commandments, he tells the people of God that you will not have any gods besides me. Not before me, besides me. <laughs> it shouldn't be any other gods. A lot of times I won't even say before me. You can't have anybody. And he emphasizes graven images because people around them in different communities around them made idols out of wood, made idols out of gold, and they worshiped those things. They had them in their homes. Those were physical idols. And what he said was, you can't have those things. Jesus emphasizes when he speaks to his disciples and to the people that you will love the Lord your God with your whole existence. And one of those things that's emphasized is your mind. One of the reasons why God said that they could not have graven images is, and one, they couldn't intermarry with other cultures and things like that because they would be influenced by the culture. You see where I go back to your mind is influenced by your culture, your people, the, the, the community that you live in. And he said, the reason why you have to put me first is you'll be influenced by the people that are around you. 
You'll be influenced by the cultures that are around you. If you don't put me first, it will influence your mind. You get it? Your mind. And when we look at not only the world, but the church, a lot of things that we look at that God has said to us, God has commanded and that Jesus has emphasized those commands. We filter them through what we think is best and what we think is right. Those thoughts are influenced by the people around us, the culture around us. That culture could be our family. It could be our race. That culture could also be our churches that we've grown up in. And so what I want to share with you tonight is how we've made idols out of our opinions, not only in the world, but particularly we're talking about the church and people that uh, say that they're followers of Jesus or believers, how we've made our opinion into idols. And so let's just look at first the, the commands that we're talking about. And the command we're talking about is first, you're, you're not allowed to have any idols. Well, you know, Chaplain Winifred, I don't, Winifred, Pastor Winifred, whatever you want to call me. Um, I don't have any idols. I don't have a golden image in my house. I don't have a statue up in my house. Well, it doesn't have to be that. In this time and day and age, we have, and I've shared this before, our phones can be idols. Our spouses can be idols. Anything that we put before our children can be idols. Our jobs can be idols. Anything that we put before God can become an idol. And it was like, well, I don't put anything before God. If you make a decision to, and again, with the mind, a decision to do something in favor of that person, that thing, that whatever it is, that goes against the commands of God, then you have turned that into an idol. If you seek someone else's wisdom before going to God first, you've made their wisdom an idol because he said to seek you first, the kingdom of God. And so we take our opinion, which starts in our mind, it impacts our heart and our soul and our strength, and we convince ourselves. This is where the idolatry comes in. We convince ourselves that what we think is the framework for who God is and what God says. What we think. Not what God said. Not what Jesus said. What we think. And so again, there's this conversation where, wait a minute. Um, are you saying that we shouldn't reason and we shouldn't think? No. Mm -mm. We should be reading the word and studying the word so that we can gain wisdom from God. So that our thinking lines up with God's thinking. The scriptures tell us that we should have the mind of Christ. Why? Because Christ knows what the Father wants. He says that, and I say it often. Jesus came not with his own agenda. He came with the agenda of the master. He came with the agenda of the creator. So we always know that when we're following Jesus, we're following the will of God because Jesus came to do the will of God. And so at the end of the day, the question becomes, who are you following? Who are we following? And so this is where it becomes our opinion. And I'm going to use some examples. I'm just giving you a general framework of this. And if you want the scriptures to go with this, I've already posted those. I'm going to, I want to focus on the points. And, and I believe you, anybody that's watching me before, no, I'm a word-based person, but I, it's a lot of scriptures that go with this. So I've already posted them and I will post them again at the end of this. Um, and you should be studying your word so that you know this lines up with the word of God. Um, and I'm not taking scriptures in isolation. All of them build on each other. There is a framework for this, but our opinion says when we go with just what, what we think, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to think, but our thinking, our thought process comes from the wisdom of God and our relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Because on our own, we can reason and rationalize anything, anything in our own favor. And that's our, uh, our opinion. Uh, so first of all, we need to know that, and I said this already, that Jesus came on God's agenda and he spoke what God says. And he said, he says what God says, a true disciple and follower of Jesus follows what Jesus said. How do we have the, the mind of Christ? We follow 
what Christ said. That's the first thing. This is the part when we talk about God, and this is the thing. People say, we believe in God. God is not a belief. God is a fact. God's existence is not based on my belief in God. It's not. God is God, whether you believe in God or not. God told Moses, I am that I am. I am. Not I, I, I am if you think I am. I'm not I am if you believe I am. I just am. That's it. And the thing about that is, is that our belief is not a factor in God's existence. Our belief is a factor in our access to God. That's what the scripture says. It says faithful and just to those that, you know, believe. And it's, it's, our belief is our access. Our belief is connected to our provision for eternal life. All of those things are based on our belief. Our belief does not impact God's existence. You don't have to believe in air for air to be there. It's just there. Now, science can explain air. You may not be able to explain God, but that's fine. That does not change. God said that. It doesn't change who I am. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, you have to believe that God is a fact. Because he is. God is a fact. God is a fact. The, God is a healer. That's a fact. God is a fact. God is a deliverer. That's a fact. God is a fact. God is the creator. God is a fact. That is a fact. It is a, and you and, and a lot of times people have debates with people about evolution. You don't have to debate anybody about that. God is a fact. Well, that's your belief. No, it's not. Because God would be whether I believed in him or not. That's a fact. That's not brushing it off, excusing it, just, oh, that's just my blind faith. Mm -mm. I have to have faith for access to the things that God provides. My faith does not constitute God's existence, fact and opinion. So that's the first thing, along with the fact that we need to believe because we're followers of Jesus, that Jesus is on God. Jesus was on God's agenda. Jesus said what God said. So when I follow what Jesus says, I'm following a fact. I also had to believe that God is not a belief. God is a fact. And that's not going to work when you're talking to people that are unbelievers. Well, how can you prove that? I don't have to prove God. God proved himself. I don't have to prove God. God proved himself. I have to believe that God is who God said he is for my access. But God proved himself when he created the, the, the sun, the moons, the stars. God, create, God proved himself when he allowed me to wake up and breathe. God proved himself when he sent his son to die for people that didn't even know that they needed saving. God proved himself. God continues to prove himself. When you look at Revelations, God is a witness not only to God is a witness to himself, but in when Jesus was baptized, God was a witness to Jesus, that Jesus was his son, verbally and visually. God proves himself, so I don't have to prove him. The next thing is, and this is, this is about our opinion. Our access is based on our repentance. Our access is based on our belief that God is the son of God and God raised Jesus from the dead. That's our access. But our belief does not constitute God's existence. It doesn't. God is, God cannot lie. The scripture says, now I said, all those scriptures will be there. There's a lot of context that I need to give today. So I'll have all of those scriptures for you at the end of the video. I will post them. But God cannot lie. God cannot lie. So he's a fact because he can't lie. It's not an opinion. He can't lie. And I'm giving the distinctions of who God is so we can start looking at how our opinion becomes an idol. So he can't lie. So if anybody's lying, it's us. We lie to ourselves. We lie about our situations. We don't tell God what's really going on with us because we think that God don't know. But God can't lie. And if God says something about you, it's true. Even if you don't believe it, it's true. If God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, Nobody's opinion about you, not even your own, is true. Now, you can live in a lie, but the truth is God loves you. God 
believes in you. God cares for you. So God is giving, and this is the most important thing before we get into what where our opinion trusts us. One of the things that thing that we make a mistake in with looking at the Bible is that we think that God is making requests. He's making commands. He's telling us what we need to do. Now, because God is loving and merciful, he gives us the freedom to choose. But we have to choose. And no matter which way we choose, there's a consequence for each. There's a consequence for choice. But God is not give God is giving commands, not requests. And we attempt to conform them to our comfort. We attempt to conform God's commands to our comfort. That's idolatry. That means my opinion is more important than God's command. Again, I'm going to give examples of this, but I want to set the framework. One, a true believer follows Jesus' words because Jesus follows God's agenda and Jesus spoke what God told him to speak. Two, a true believer recognizes that God is not a belief. God is a fact. Everything that we have access to is based on our belief of who God is. But God is a fact. God is not an opinion. God is not a belief. God is a fact. The true and the living God is a fact. The next thing that a follower of Jesus has to believe is that God doesn't lie. Anything that God said is true. Everything that God said about you is true. Now, you can choose to believe a lie. You could choose to believe what other people say about you. You could choose to believe what society says about you. And again, that goes back to the mind, the culture that you're in, whether it's your family, whether it's your community. What do you believe? And when we put what the world says, what our family says, what our culture says, before what God says, that's, what, that, that's when it becomes an idol. And so these are the things that are the frameworks. The last thing is he's giving commands, not requests. God is not asking you, would you like to? He's not saying, would you please? He's saying, do this. Because I said to do this. And what I want to talk about with this is we can make idols out of all kinds of things. We can make idols out of our jobs. Like I said, our friends, our family, our children. We can make idols out of preachers, celebrities, our significant others. And when we do that, it puts us in a place of vulnerability because what we've decided when we do that is God doesn't know what he's talking about. What, what are you saying, Winifred? I'm not saying that. Your actions are saying that. My actions are saying God doesn't know what he's talking about. God says, don't covet. Well, I just, I like their car. I'm not like wishing they would die or anything. We always take something to the extreme so we don't seem as bad as we actually are. Disobedience is disobedience. It's like with your children. Well, mama, did she, you tell them to stay out the cookie jar. I only had two cookies. I didn't go to the extreme and I didn't eat all the cookies, so I'm not disobedient. If your mama said not to eat the cookies, eating one cookie is disobedience. That's it. If God, God says that and Jesus said that you're with your wife or your husband, that's, that's who you're supposed to be with. That's who you're incumbent with. Oh, you don't know how this was. They was this way. We we just couldn't work it out. Oh, you know, I I messed up and da da da. Okay, but again, there's consequences to that. But what I've decided is, oh, God couldn't have meant that. That's too harsh. We even hear that in the church. God couldn't have meant that. God is a God of love. We take a piece of it and we form it. This is where so. In the in in the times in the Old Testament times and even the New Testament, the the communities around them were making idols out of brass, out of gold, out of wood, and God talks about that. It is you will worship a God that's made with human hands. We do the same thing, but we mold our opinion. We mold our opinion to an idol. Oh, it can't be that bad. What God couldn't have meant that. Because our society around us, even our churches, we give our minds over to that and we don't allow the Lord, here's the remedy, to renew our mind. When we get saved and we get saved from sin and saved from destruction, we get saved, we're getting saved so that we don't go to hell and we're also getting saved to live an abundant life. 
what people tend to want to focus on is the abundance part. And there's nothing wrong with that because Jesus promised an abundant life. The part we, we get saved from sin, but we also get saved from hell. And that means that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We like the saving part, but we don't like the part where we have to follow Jesus. All right, now, so let's get into opinion so we can really get clear on what this is. So I've set the framework is that anything that we in our mind, which our mind is impacted by the things around us, our family, our culture, our community, our mind is our mind, our way of thinking. So when we get saved, we've given our life to the Lord, but we also have to allow the Lord to renew our mind. So before Jesus, we had our own agenda. Jesus didn't have his own agenda. He was following the agenda of God. But before salvation, we had our own agenda. As a follower of Jesus, our our only agenda is to obey God. That translates everywhere. So I don't want people to think that they have to be a preacher or a monk or a nun or you're praying all day long or you're praying. No, it's, it's, it's in every aspect of your life. But as a believer, every aspect of your life is impacted by the agenda of God. We are seeking God's face about everything, everything, everything. So, the second thing is we, we acknowledge the fact that God is a fact. God's a fact in my life. He's not just what I believe in. He's a fact. He's a fact. The, he's the fact is I'm breathing because of him. The fact is I'm sane because of him. The fact is he created the universe. The fact is he's coming back again. God is a fact in the life of a believer. We believe what he said, but our belief is connected to our access. Our belief has nothing to do. So we go with that. He can't lie. And I'm setting all this up so we can start looking at the idols of our opinion. He can't lie. Now we can, the world can, the culture that we're in can, and those lies impact our mind and impact our thinking. So then we start taking a lie and trying to conform God's truth to our lie. The next thing I said was God is giving commands, not request. Another form of idolatry is when we take what God has commanded and we say, oh, he's given us the the freedom to choose. You can choose, but that don't change the fact that it was a command. So to choose not to obey, disobedience has a consequence. Disobedience has a price. He'll let you choose, but your choice is to obey. That's what you should be doing. Okay, so let's look at how we make these idols. So I'm going to use uh, this as a just just thinking. So I heard a conversation and it struck me uh, where this person, this preacher actually was talking about how to talk to people about uh, being celibate and relationships with being celibate. And so let's talk about the mind. And again, that is what impacts what we do. So the mind of the world, the culture that we're in, even our families, and what this person said was, is that I could talk to young people about being celibate, but people that have been, you know, kids that are teenagers, but people that are 30 and older, you know, I got to come with another gospel. That's a lie. Bible says that there's only one gospel. There's no other gospel. It's what Jesus said. And that's the end of it. Period. That's it. That's it. So that's the first thing is. And this was a preacher that said this, but that, but other people do it too. We, we have people in the church and we, other believers will say this, you know, oh, that's too harsh. God didn't mean that. Well, what did he say? What did he say? So let's talk about celibacy. Let's just use that for example. So first of all, the world will make fun of you if you choose to be celibate, whether you're 15 or 55. If you've been celibate for a long time, you're made fun of. People will look at you, what? Oh my God, how you going to do that? Hey, 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 Elzebel, some people will even say, oh, if you don't, and it, this was said on TV, oh, if, if the doctor said, if you don't have sex, it'll all dry up down there. So what, what you're saying is, is that the true and the living God who has commanded us <laughs> that if you ain't married, <laughs> if you ain't married, you ain't supposed to have sex. That what he, so he's the liar because that's what's being said. Now the Bible says that God can't lie. So when somebody says to you that something that God said can't be done, run for your life. They're liars. 
They're from the pit of hell. They're liars. Because you may be struggling, but God will keep you. God will, and this, I'm not talking about, we, we're using celibacy because there's the lie that's being done. That you can't be kept. Then there's another lie. There's a lot of things, and I'm using this because I'm a woman. A woman. There's a lot of things that go on with women's bodies that because, because for the, for, and I'm, and I'm going to teach this again just to women. Women's health and women, gynecological health, all of that stuff has been almost borderline hit or miss, witchcraft, we'll figure it out. Because first of all, for a long time, women weren't valued, not just black women, women, period. Women weren't taken seriously. They didn't understand periods. They didn't understand birth. They were just learning. For a long time, black women had to have babies through a midwife because they wouldn't even let us in the hospitals. And the midwife were delivering much better and healthier babies. All of a sudden, gynecology and women's health became a thing. So let's talk about that. God put things, natural things on this earth to restore and replenish your body when you age. There are natural vitamins, not no fillers, pharmaceutical vitamins. Ashwakanda is an excellent herb. And I'm using this as an example to kind of act that lie. That if you're married... And because you're older, that's what they're talking about. You know, you have vaginal dryness. That's what they mean when they say you're going to dry up. First of all, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there for vaginal dryness. That's a whole lot. Second of all, there's things that you can eat. to. to, to so that's a whole lot. Why would God give you the gift of marriage and give you the gift of intercourse, not just for children, but for pleasure, and not be able to let you have pleasure? Why would he force you to have pain with that? No, he doesn't. And and they're not telling you that. There, there are doctors that will ask you, well, are you having sex? No, I'm not having sex. I'm celibate. And they're looking at you like you're crazy. But what did God say? So the same God that can give women children when they're later in life is the same God that can replenish, replenish and reverse. So the lie is a lie. Community, I mean, there will be entertainers that say they celibate. People make fun of them so bad that they would go out there and do all kinds of stuff. Then they end up sad, depressed, discouraged. I'm just using that as an example. As an example. What did God say? Okay? And so that's an example of an idol because my mind says, oh, it, he couldn't have been that serious. Oh, that was the Old Testament. Oh, because we don't teach what Jesus said, you don't even know that Jesus said that. That Jesus talked about that, you know, somebody had a whole big argument about being single. And it's like, well, no. The truth of the matter is, if you're single, you're celibate. If you're single, you're celibate. That's how that works. Sex is for married people. And I'm not saying this from some high and lofty place that I had it right all the time. No, like Paul said, of the sinners, I was the chief of them. Chief, chief sinner, honey. It took the Holy Ghost and the word to reveal to me, wait a minute, Negro, you trying to, you trying to go to hell? What you trying to do? God is trying to keep us. And when we don't read the word, when we don't study the word, when we have people that will tell us again, there are commands. When we conform those commands to our comfort, conform, mold it to our comfort, we are making idols with our opinion. My opinion says, honey, I got to get mine. That's what my opinion says. It ain't just sex. It could be somebody else's husband. It could be somebody else's boyfriend. It could be somebody else's wife. It could be somebody's car. It could be somebody's title. We will conform our opinion. We will take God's command and conform it to our opinion. Our opinion becomes an idol and that's what we worship. My way, not God's way, my way. And God's like, wait a minute, hold on. That's not what I said. And so if we don't know what he said, we'll hear enough that, oh, well, okay. I don't, you know, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do all of that. When God says not to use covet, when God said not to covet, people's things, people's spouses, all of that. Well, you don't know what I've been through. Now, I, was, I start molding God's command to my comfort. You don't know what I've been through. Well, God, I worked real hard and went to college. I deserve this. Molding God's command to my opinion. When I mold it, take his command and mold it to my comfort, my opinion, 
that becomes an idol. She don't need that position. She too old. It's time for me to take that spot. God said, respect your elders. God said, be patient. God said, not co covet. Well, God ain't mean for them to be doing that that long. If God didn't want them to be doing it, they wouldn't be doing it. There's nothing that God don't see. There's nothing God don't do. And maybe God is raising that person up to raise you up. Titles. Titles. I taught this before and I'm going to say it again. A title is a target. A title, and I've had some. A title is a target. A calling is a covered. A calling is covered. A calling is covered. A title is a target. And so again, if I covet a title, then what I've done is said that what God said about me is not enough. What God spoke to Paul to write that your gifts will make room for you is not enough. That's not enough. That's not enough. So then I had to conform God's command to my comfort. And that's my opinion, which comes from my mind. And that's idolatry. I go down the list. You know, how we treat people, how we treat people that don't look like us, whether you're black, Latino, white, whatever, how we treat people that don't look like us because we're convinced that God won't take care of us. Oh, they're taking our jobs. They're taking, you know, they're taking our spots. They're taking, they're taking, they're taking. So what you can't see is that the ruler that's over you is oppressing you because instead of seeking God for your provision, which is already done, I'm looking at somebody else and saying they're taking from me. So then I'm coveting what they have, which any good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. I'm, I'm talking to people that claim to be believers because unbelievers going to do this stuff. I'm talking about how God is trying to transform us by renewing our mind. And that's the solution. I'm jumping ahead of myself. But the solution to the problem is given by Jesus, but it's also given by Paul. The first solution, well, I'm going to talk about, about, about Jesus first. The first solution goes all the way back to Joshua. And I preached this before. It's in Joshua 24. Joshua told them, choose, choose, choose this day who you will serve. Choose, choose whether it's the true and the living God or the God of the people that we live around. Same thing. Jesus said, you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose. You, you can pick which one you want. You can serve God or you can serve mammon. And I taught that before that, you know, mammon is money, but mammon is currency. There's all types of currency. There's a currency that you, the check you make on your job, but then there's also the currency of relationships, influence, all of that. There's currency. So choose. That's the first thing you got to choose. And then Paul, with this emphasis of who he's, he's talking to the, um, talking to the, the Christians in Rome, he says this, he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the first part, the conform part, you're conforming to the world. And I use Plato. I, I preach this often. I use silly putty because silly putty, you can make that conform to whatever it presses on. If your family is pressing on you, if your community is pressing on you, if your church is pressing on you, something that does not line up with the word of God and you conform to it, what you have done is made an idol of it. Well, they said what they said was right, though, because I don't think that these people should be getting all of this stuff for free. What did God say? What did the word say? God said, take care of the foreigner, not the foreigners that you like, not the foreigners that look like you, but the foreigner, period. So that's the brown foreigner and the light foreigner, the foreigner. Again, if we don't know the word, then we will create our own version of the word. We will mold God's commands to our comfort. And if we mold God's commands to our comfort, what we're doing is using our opinion and our opinion becomes an idol. Amen. Amen. So what we cover today is. Knowing who God is through Jesus Christ, knowing what, and these are the things that help us, knowing what Jesus did, knowing what Jesus said. That means you need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some people have been saved a long time, but they still don't know what Jesus said. And because they don't know what Jesus said, it makes it real easy to conform to what people say. 
So if you sow a seed, you're going to get a harvest. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. Our belief in God gives us access to things, but we don't get to choose how God releases those things. And the question becomes, will you serve God? Will you worship God if it don't turn out the way you want it to? But what we've been fed by our culture, by the thing, again, this is what feeds the mind, is I'm supposed to have it. I'm supposed to get it. Even as a believer, I'm supposed to get it. I'm supposed to get blessings, but I'm not supposed to get suffering. But that's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus said. And that doesn't mean that you need to look forward to a whole life of suffering. No. But if you suffer, if you go through, can you still bless him? If you don't get that position, can you still bless him? If you don't, don't work out with you and that dude or that chick, do, can you still bless him? If the church isn't growing as fast as you want, will you still bless him? If they kick you out, will you still bless him? Will you still bless them if your children are on drugs? Will you still bless them if they graduate from college? Will you still bless him? Because according to the world and the society that we live in as believers, we're supposed to get it our way when we want it and how we want it. God is not Burger King. That's not how it works. But that's what we've been told. And so we conform. Our opinion comes from the thinking that we have based on the culture that we're in. Again, it's not limited to race. It could be the community you grew up in. And that's what I started with at the top. What I want to say to you is how we tear down the idol of our opinion is by knowing what God said, knowing what Jesus said, knowing what Jesus did, and obeying what Jesus said. Obeying. You can know it and not obey it. That's where the idolatry comes in. I, I know what he said, but I'm going to make this work for me. And so I want to encourage you. Um, the scriptures will be posted for this. Some of the scriptures I already had uh, to read those scriptures. It will help you understand that. But the biggest thing to conquer this, this idolatry of our opinion. And we've done this. Like you can be in this society, but once you become a believer, that is one of the scriptures that is constantly a part of your life. The two greatest commands is to love God with your whole existence. And today this requires you loving God with your mind. I know what I think, but what does God think? I know what I think, but what does God think? That's, that's loving God with your whole mind. I can't have my North Philly mind and God's mind too. And, and that thing raised up. Now, I ain't going to tell you no lies. I can't have my North Philly mind and, and, and God's mind too. The mind of Christ too. I can't have my street teacher mind and the mind of Christ too. Now, all of the wisdom that you have, and if you continue to seek the Lord, all of the intelligence that you have, and it goes back to the mind, all of the intelligence that you have comes from God anyway. Your ability to be able to do research, your ability to be able to read a recipe, to be able to write, all of that, all of that comes from God. Our ability to be able to create things, whether it's a piece of cake or a building or an, a plan for students, all of that comes from God. So if I got all this intelligence for God, how am I, how am I being, you know, how's my opinion? I, didn't he give me my opinion? No, he gave you commands and facts. He gave you commands and facts. Your opinion is molded by the world. This is why Paul's statement, be not conformed, molded by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word renewing means that it's a continuum. I got saved when I was very young. He's still renewing my mind. It's some stuff that I just realized in the past two years that, that I thought was, that it was straight crazy. It was. That, was, that me. It's stuff that I look back on and I'm like, why am I not dead? What was I doing? I convinced myself and we convince ourselves that wrong is right and up is down and sun is dark and dark is sun. We do it for our comfort. 
Now, there's a difference between you experiencing trauma and not getting help for trauma. But even with trauma, you have to make a decision. God loves me. He put people out there to help me. I need help. Yeah. Because if God loves you, he wants you to get help. He wants you to get help. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be whole. So when you start hearing things, you know, kill yourself. You a horrible person. You too fat. You too ugly. That ain't what God said about you. God said that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are wonderful. I created you in my image. So how could God create something in his image and it's ugly? Now, if you're overweight and you need to lose weight to be healthy, then you say, I'm overweight, but God's going to help me to lose weight. I'm not fat. Same thing. I'm, I'm too thin. I'm too skinny. God, I need to gain weight so that I can be healthier and stronger. Because the psalmist wrote that he fills my mouth with good things so my youth is renewed like the eagles. So I've said a lot and I know that it's like, oh, the, at the core of this, for my people that's in the scriptures, at the core of this, at the core of my teaching today, in regard to idolatry, there's two scriptures that you can hang on. Well, there's three from the Gospels, but they all say the same thing. And Matthew, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you can find that in my previous videos, but I'm going to post this after. But the scripture where Jesus says that the first and greatest command is that you love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, and your whole strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And I say love God with your whole existence, so you ain't confused. And today we focused on the mind because the mind influences our opinion, the mind. All around us, the culture around us, everything influences the mind. So that's that's the first scripture. The second scripture is, uh, the scripture, section scripture comes from Romans, Romans chapter 2. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The way you're going to destroy the idol of your opinion that works in contrast to God's truth is by allowing the Lord to renew your mind. How does the Lord renew your mind? Well, when you read the word and you know what Jesus said, again, I said, keep Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, keep the gospels in front of you. Keep his words in front of you. If it's in red, you got an old King James. If it's in red, it's what he said. Keep what he said in front of you so you know. If you know what he said, you know what God wants, period. That's the way you tear down the idol of your opinion that's in contrast to God. Because it's not God's not interested in your opinion. He's interested in your obedience to his word. Now, we can share our opinions with our friends. We can share why the 49ers lost and we can share why the Eagles won. Uh, we can share our opinions all day long. God's not operating in opinions. He's operating in his commands and he expects his children to obey them. So that's how you tear down the idol of your opinion. Again, I'm so grateful that you spent this time with me tonight. I spent a lot of time on this um, and I wanted to make clear what that is, but I also will have a post with first the scriptures, and then I'm going to have something that you have a step that this is how our opinion is developed. This is where it comes from. God is a fact. He's not a belief. Our belief gives us access, but God is a fact. And the way that we tear down the idols of our opinion, what is developed with the culture around us is by studying his word, knowing what he said, obeying what he said, and having, that's how our mind is renewed. And that's how we're transformed. Because again, we are allowing the Lord to transform us moment by moment. We cannot hold on to the way that we were. We cannot hold on to the way that we used to talk. We cannot hold on to the way that we used to act. We cannot hold on. I, I that the day the Lord deal with me. I said, so she's trying to come back up, Lord. That ain't who you created me to be. Old me is not who you created me to be. You know? Sassy mouth me. Anyway, I'm going to use this. This is the last word I'm going to use. Last example of opinion. Opinion. So the Bible says that um, bittersweet water shouldn't come out the same fountain. That means that you can't be blessing somebody with your mouth and then cursing. Blessings and curses can't come out the same mouth. Jesus himself said, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Anything else is from the devil. That means say what you got to say. Now there is an opinion. Mold. 
there's an opinion. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians, people that claim, well, not Christians, you know me, followers of Jesus. But there are people that claim to be Christians. And it's okay to cuss. It's not. I ain't going to say I ain't dealt with it. I ain't going to say I ain't struggled with it. I ain't going to even say that every now and then somebody that I feel, I know we say people push our buttons. Mm, we make a conscious decision to respond the way we respond. And, but what did Jesus say? So here's the thing about that idol of our opinion. The idol of our opinion says, it don't matter what you say. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I think. Now, when we respond to people, no matter what it is we're sharing with them, it really ain't what we think either. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Lord. Now, if you don't feel like the Bible is the word of God, and again, we have 66 books. There are 100. You know, get you an Ethiopian Bible. There's 100. There's other, there's other books that were taken from the Bible. But overall, we got those 66. If you don't believe those 66 and you don't believe the four where Jesus is speaking, what, what you're doing? But we'll conform because the world, we have images on YouTube. We have images on TV where there are people that are supposed to be leading us that cuss. That cuss from the pulpit. And I'm using that not to pick on people that cuss, but that's just an opinion. Oh, it ain't that bad. Well, did, well, wait a minute. What did God say? Some people will even say, oh, Jesus got angry. Where is it recorded that Jesus cussed? Where? Where was recorded? And are you getting angry about the same things that he's getting angry about? This man had cussed in his pulpit. And I know a couple of preachers that, you know, you that mad that you letting, letting the words fly. Then you got an angry issue. <laughs> Conform to this world. So what that is, is my opinion says that it's okay. Because the world has said it's okay. They got t-shirts say, I'm saying, but I cuss a little bit. Wait a minute. No, uh-uh. You don't cuss a little bit. No. But the world has told me it's okay. And again, I'm not putting down people that struggle. I'm using that because I gave a couple of examples that dealt with relationships. And I'm just, I'm closing out with some examples. We already done hit the, hit the meat and potatoes. I'm just closing out with a few examples. No, that's not it. That's not my opinion. What does the Bible say? I have a really good friend and we'll talk about different things. And we, this is how we challenge each other. When we get upset and we get heated because both of us got a view. And then we'll go, well, what did the Bible say? That shut the conversation right down. Because we know what the Bible That's another thing. If you don't know what the Bible says, you can create whatever idol of your opinion you can. But when you know what the Bible says and somebody says, but what does the Bible say? What does, what does the Bible say? You got to know. And then there's some people that will lie to you and say, did the Bible say this? So some, when it comes to reaching people, reaching the lost, some plant, some water, God gives the increase. You ain't got no harvest if God don't give the increase. I'm going to say that again. You don't have a harvest if God don't give the increase. It's God that decides. You could do all this stuff. You could do all this work and all this. And God may say, no, nah, I need you to go through a few things. Not because you're a bad person. I'm trying to strengthen you. Some stuff happened to so-called good people. And Jesus said, ain't nobody good. But sometimes stuff happens to us. But yeah, that's an example of molding. that. That's a, that's a, a culture that has molded us to believe it's okay if I cuss a little bit. No. When stuff come out of my mouth, I'm immediately repenting. Because I'm like, God, now you ain't. What am I doing? Mm -mm. I'm going to give it 100 with you. For real. And that's not to condemn people that do. It is to condemn people that make excuses for it. Because once you make an excuse, you're saying that your opinion is more important than what the word of God says. It's not. It's not. The, our opinions are never, never above the word of God and what God says. And we don't take the word of God in isolation. Some of this stuff is simple stuff that's in the word. But because we're not studying it, we're not preaching it, we're not teaching it. It's like, oh, why she got to be, you know, why they got to be so much? Why they got to be so difficult? Uh -uh. What did God say? It's not what Winifred said. I'm, I'm required to teach it, but I'm also required to study it and, and, and review it and look at it. And, and when people want to give you a word that doesn't challenge you to grow, you need to be afraid. You need to be concerned. Because if everything conforms and fits to your comfort, mm, Following Jesus isn't comfortable. It's victorious. It brings joy, but it's not always comfortable. Amen? 
So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed through the living word, through the preach word, through prayer, through seeking God's face by the, the, for the renewing of your mind. If not, your mind, which has absorbed all the culture around you, will begin to mold God's commands to your comfort. And I don't wish that for any of you. So going out and wrapping up, I'm going to pray. And um, I'm going to also say that again. I talked about, for those people that didn't get it, I talked about celibacy. Because there's this mindset out there that, and don't have, I'm not trying to be mean. Don't have people that have decided that it's okay to be in habitual sin giving you advice. Don't do that. I don't care if it's, it's, it's Dr. Lawyer, Indian Chief. I don't care if it's your preacher, whoever it is. If I go up here and, and I'm, I start being in habitual sin and making excuses, turn me off. Amen? Turn me off. It's the difference if you make a mistake or you're struggling with something and, and, and you trying to get some help and you slip it. That happens to drug addicts a lot of times. They're struggling and they're trying to get free. And it's something that you struggle with a long time. You're trying to get free. And I'm, we're going to pray about that tonight. But don't don't be listening to people that say it's okay to beat on women or men to steal. Oh, it's okay. You you can put this and that on your taxes. Don't 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 be okay with people that tell you to lie. Preachers, don't be okay with people. I don't care if they was your elder, leader, whoever they were, to tell you it's this is how you get them to get the money. Because behind closed doors, that's what they say. I'm not saying what I heard. I'm saying what I know. I done been in the room with them. Oh, yeah, this is how you get the money. It's tax season. They got money because it's tax season. Don't feel like you got to get across the pulpit and make, and make people feel bad because, you know, they got tax money. No, you have to pray that the Lord, the same Lord that you're telling them to pray to, to use wisdom with their money, you have to pray that the same Lord that said that he will provide, will provide. Otherwise, you are creating an idol. You have molded your comfort. It is uncomfortable for me not to know where the lights going to be on at the church. Well, it's uncomfortable for your your, your people not to know if the light's going to be on at their house. <laughs> but we're all supposed to be trusting the true and living God who said he will provide for us. So we either believe him or we don't. That's the thing. God doesn't lie. So for us to start conforming things to our comfort is saying that God lied when he said he provide. Now, he's not going to provide the way you want him to provide all the time or at all sometimes. He's going to provide the way he thinks is best to provide. Amen? Hmm? So I talked about this last year, and I will say this again. Don't slide back into old habits because it's getting uncomfortable. Don't slide back into old habits because it's getting, you know what your old habit was, whether it's in the church, whether it's on your job, whether it's with your relationships. Don't slide back into his or her DMs because you're lonely, because it's cold, because it's wintertime. Don't slide back into it. Don't slide back into being hostile and mean because, you know, you you dealing with your own feelings and you feel... No, don't slide into it. Turn the TV off. Turn the internet off. Turn all people that are feeding your spirit with vulgarness, violence, anger, all of that. Some stuff that seems like nothing. Some of these little TV shows, and I'm a woman, when women are fighting all the time, and you wonder why you want to fight somebody. You wonder why you're suspicious. Oh, it ain't that bad. It's just a TV show. But Jesus said, if, if your eye... So we aren't going around plucking eyes out. So we need to turn it off. I'm using this as an example as we close. If we're not plucking eyes out, we're not cutting hands off. Now, they do that in other countries. We're not plucking eyes out. We're not cutting our hands off. Then we need to stop. You don't have to pluck your eyes out. Turn it off. You don't need to pluck your eyes out. Turn your head away. You don't need to pluck your eyes out. Delete it from your phone. You don't need to pluck it out. But, hey, you don't need to cut your hand off. Stop taking it. Stop taking it in your mind first, and then you won't take it with your hand. I'm going to wrap up. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I, it's not a theme. It's just a mindset. This is a thing. Renewing your mind. The first and greatest commandment. And I'm going to be, I'm, I will be emphasizing that for a while. The first and greatest commandment is to love God with your whole existence. That is your heart, your soul your mind, and your strength. So today we focused on tearing down that idol 
that is influenced by our mind, which is the idol of my opinion, the idol of your opinion, and allowing the Lord to renew, our, transform us by the renewing of our mind. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that you've allowed us to, to look in and, and see your glory in your word that shows us that we can begin to look like you intended us to look, to be in your image, to be in your presence and to be like you, to talk like you, to walk like you. We thank you for Jesus because without him, we don't even have access to you. We pray that those that are listening tonight, first, those that are unbelievers would see the need to be saved, not only from their sins, but also to be able to walk in the abundant life that you desire for them. So those that say, Lord, I'm a sinner, I repent. That means I want to turn away completely from a life of habitual sin. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead, that they are saved tonight. We pray, oh God, that they will find a fellowship of believers to study your word, to pray, and to grow in fellowship with you. God, will we pray tonight for all the believers that are on here now and those that will listen later. We pray that they would hear your voice, not mine. They will hear your voice saying this is the way to walk in it, to walk in my command to put me first in every aspect of your life. And the areas that they see that their mind has been conformed to the world and they have set up idols because of their opinions and because of themselves, that this day they would open their hearts and their minds and their spirits for you to begin the process of transforming them by the renewing of their minds. I pray that their minds will be free from the things of this world, that their minds will be free from the things that come through TV and the internet, that their minds will be free from the culture that they have grown up in and the culture that they work in and the culture that they live in, and that they would be transformed into the kingdom person that you have called them to be. It is in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Again, this is Winifred. It's a life more abundantly in Christ. And on life more abundantly in Christ, we believe and follow the commands of Jesus where he said to make disciples and teach them. Looking forward to February, Lord's will. We are going to continue talking about loving God. What does love got to do with it? Uh, so within the next hour, look for a posting of the scriptures that connect to the teaching for today. Give me about an hour, hour and a half. Talk to you later. Bye.